Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Catholic Talk Show. Today, we're going to be talking about a liturgical season of the Catholic Church. That's right. We're going to look at the liturgical seasons, what all the colors mean, what all the feast days and solemnities are, and when you have to go to Mass and why. Let's get one thing very clear. The new year doesn't begin in January. It begins at Advent. Tis the season, boys. Uh, the liturgical. To be season. liturgical. That's <laughs> right. That's right. I'm uh, gonna be doing a lot of listening today because <laughs> I don't know a lot about it. I do know that the church starts in Advent. Well, no, I'm sure you know a lot more than you than you realize because you know you've you've been a cradle Catholic and you've been exposed to the liturgical seasons from the time of your youth. So to realize, you know, being Catholic, we are a liturgical people. And liturgy means work, and we've got to be dressed properly when we go to work. That's right. There's a work uniform, and I know that you're intimately familiar with that. And normally you're known for wearing black, but you've got a you got a closet full of colors like uh, like uh, a Broadway singer. Dude. I, I'm telling you, an assortment of all sorts of colors. And there's there's some colors too that we're going to come to that you know priests wear uh, that can wear certain colors. And I don't even have that in my closet. So there's still colors that, you know galore that I haven't That's, even explored. It's a whole rainbow of colors, Ricky. <laughs> whole rainbow. So liturgy means work. Liturgia, the, the Greek work, word, the work of God. And going and I, on I loved and, you know we we had a sit down conversation with Bishop Polmeyer. And, you know, he shared the beautiful reflection on the work, the yeah. one work, right, as it relates to the kingdom of God. Right. And that is precisely what liturgy is. It is a work being done, you know, that we are cooperating with. And mm -hmm. Holy Mother Church encourages us to fully, actively, and consciously participate in that work. And that requires some study and some insight. So we hope that this show is going to provide you that insight. And before we go any further into, you know, greater insights, mm. those buttons yeah, are do you insight. see with the your buttons site, are insight there's, right there's now. You gotta click them. Right Which now. ones? I think subscribe. Subscribe. Which and button would you push? I like the bells. You like the bells? Yeah. When you click the a bell, bells, what do man. you get? You get notifications <laughs> when we have new videos. <laughs> yep, it's always the season to click subscribe, click like, click share. It's always the season if you have such a generous heart to go to catholictalkshow.com forward slash Patreon and see how you can support the show. Get all kinds of great gear that Father Rich is modeling right now. Hoodies, coffee cups, stickers, mm. all kinds of cool stuff. So catholictalkshow.com forward slash Patreon. I do like these new generation coffee cups. I, I use them all the time. I have like three different versions and I like them all. Yeah, yeah and you could join us on our hangout too. Me and you That's sometimes right. hang out with people on the Zoom, the patrons on Zoom. We built up a really nice relationship with a lot of our patrons. It's you know, kind of like our way of uh, not just showing our uh, our gratitude, but it's our way of building the community that what we're building online and trying to meet some of these people. Yeah, and yeah there's like such a strong solidarity that's been coming out of yeah. our Patreon and a mm -hmm. strong solidarity coming out of the ministry, especially yeah. with our pilgrimages mm -hmm. and our hangouts. It's it's just awesome to see what God has formed in the Catholic Talk Show family. So we appreciate the support of the Patreons out there. We support, you know, in every respect, you know, good Catholic content. So our sponsors, Exodus and Hallow, and so many of other relationships, everything Catholic, it's just awesome to see what's happening as a result of this ministry. All right, so let's jump into this episode here, and let's let's crack open this calendar and figure it out. So the Catholic liturgical calendar is a very specific thing within the church that helps us guide the liturgies. Uh, it's very, I mean, it can be kind of complicated because there is a lot of nuance to it. Oh, yeah. But I think at the highest level, understanding that the Catholic calendar, number one, doesn't go necessarily along with our yearly calendar, our secular calendar, although we've done an episode on that where we showed how it was actually the Pope who set New Year's Day and reorganized the calendar, which is why it's called the Gregorian calendar. Yep, as opposed to the Julian calendar. That's right, which the Orthodox brothers use. Mm -hmm. But the Catholic liturgical season is broken down into six primary seasons. Advent... Christmas, Lent, then the Triduum, Easter, and Ordinary Time. Now, e Ordinary Time is broken into two, right? You have Ordinary Time after Christmas and Ordinary Time after the after Pentecost. Mm -hmm. So 
six, six and a half, depending on how you view it, but six different seasons. And they're all really meant to accompany us in mass to show us the life of Christ and to help teach people the kind of, I guess, the the temporal nature of Christ's ministry, but then also tie us to the seasons of the year and so many other really great reasons. What's the, what's the history of the liturgy in the church that we can look back to and see? I mean, I know, I know that the, the, the Jewish Israel followed some sort of liturgical seasons too mm-hmm. as well, you know, because you have the season of penance. And Are you digging back into the seminary deep roots right now? Oh, absolutely not. I didn't learn anything there. Um, so, no, uh, my Bishop Polmeyer has my file. Don't you worry. Uh, if you want to see it, you need the big hat. Uh, the big hat. Uh, yeah, like, I mean, so what is the, what, what is the history? Because, I mean, the church for 300 years was persecuted. Like, is this something that kind of arose out of a, a need to develop some sort of uniformity, some universality? Because it, that's what the church has always been really good at, is yeah. this universality. And I think, it's, I think it's important to recognize the fact that from the Jewish roots of the practices uh, in Judaism— um, in in the sense of what was happening within that conscientious sense of what their prayer looked like, what their worship looked like, all of what generated in the early church came from that sensibility. And but there's also a charismatic element to this too. You know, when when we look at the breaking of the bread or some of these ritual practices that Jesus instituted himself, these are things that are rooted in. Orthodox practice, orthopraxis, in respect to Jesus, because he is fulfilling the law. He is fulfilling what is proper. You know, the presentation of of Jesus in the temple is a, a good example of this. You mm-hmm. know, so uh, he, he's honoring and fulfilling all that has been in the practice of the children of Israel, and then what spawns forth is something beautifully new That's and right. charismatic in the power of the Holy Spirit. So, so when we think about liturgia, when we think about liturgy in the sense of work, and we're, and Sheila, you were, you were describing it perfectly. It's like, we're looking at the life of Christ. We're going through the, the calendar and the year, but it's like, we're, we're uncovering the mystery of who Jesus is. Well, God sent Jesus into the world and he revealed the dignity of human labor and the works of Christ on earth and his public ministry are so important to the remembrance of our Catholic practice. Mm-hmm. So seeing the works of Christ, where do we fit in? How do we work in that sense? So St. Paul shares that beautiful reflection that's so mysterious, but may I make up what is lacking in the offering of Christ? You know, God in his mercy, it's not that Jesus was uh, lacking anything. He's fully God. But in the perfection of Jesus's work, he offered us a greater participation. And when you think about a father, you know, who loves his child or loves his son, he's going to want his son to learn the trades and the skills and all that the father has has stored up for his son, wants to pass that on fully. You were talking about Albacete yesterday, talking about the father from all eternity mm-hmm. and the creation of the cosmos. Can you share a little bit of that? Because I thought that was fascinating because it yeah. shows that kind of share in the work, the one work, if you will. Yeah, and the reason why I, w- I was sharing that is because the Trinity is kind of hard to grasp, but yet the there's a singularity in the in the Father and the Son, the, but they are one. Yeah. <clears throat> so, you know, uh, the love that the Father showers onto Jesus isn't, hey, I'm going to go send you down there and you're going to die. But it started with creation. So he created through Christ as a gift to him, mm-hmm. right? So like that relationship is pretty profound because the whole cosmos was created mm-hmm. in and through Christ as a gift to the son mm-hmm. from the father, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you know, and you listen to that talk of Albacete at St. John Vianney yeah. college seminary. So yeah. at least you remembered something. Oh yeah. The, it's in my file. It's in your file. It's in yeah. his file. Check his file, Bishop Pullmeyer. <laughs> so, so kind of going back to your comment, a lot of, I guess the, maybe not the specific dates, but kind of the, the concept of calendars and feasts and time set apart does go back to the old Testament, to the Hebrew practice. So you had things like, the Feast of the Booths, you had the mm-hmm. Feast of the Weeks, the Rosh Feast Hashanah. of the Trumpets, you had Passover, the Feast of uh, the Atonement. So you had all these kind of feast days, and that has been fulfilled in the New Testament in Christ's life. Uh, but you also see a lot of parallels like 40 days, octaves, jubilee years, right? 
specific readings tied to specific days. So it, it, it's a, a natural evolution once that the, the covenant had been renewed, renewed through yeah. Christ. So I guess the, you know, the, it's like how the Julian and the Gregorian calendar evolved based on the reality of the people. And I think it's also important. And also what was revealed. What was revealed. It's also important to note that a lot of this is based on, look, God does not need our sacrifices. God does not need our offerings. God doesn't need our feast days. He has everything. He is complete. These are the things that are instituted for our sake so that we can grow in piety and love. And it's a natural thing to follow through the years and see the changing of time and celebrating it and marking it and then consecrating those days and those seasons to God. So it's an evolution of the Jewish practices fulfilled in Christ based on the needs of humanity and the way that human beings actually work. Yeah, upheld, maintained, improved upon yep. through the Holy Spirit and the church. That's right. So again, we have the six or six and a half liturgical seasons. Mm -hmm. One of the cool things, again, with the church is that there is specific colors tied to all of these mm -hmm. liturgical seasons. So if you're ever at Mass and you're like, oh, maybe Father Rich just decided, you know. Yeah, if you ever have those felt banners put up, you know, and you change the season out, you put the felt banners up. Right, no. And well, the appropriate color. <laughs> yeah, Father Rich doesn't wake up in the morning and say, you know, I'm feeling green today. I'm just going to pop on my green vestments. He's like, you know, my, my baby blue eyes are looking great. I bet you this look great with my white chalice <laughs> doesn't work like that. There is color codes that define the season mm -hmm. that tie into symbolically the nature of the season. So, so a good example of this is, you know, just even uh, this morning I wore white because it was a memorial. Mm -hmm. You know, we were memorializing one of the saints who is not a martyr. So, you know, white calls to mind also Christmas, Easter, you know, that we honor and we have come to discern that this particular memorial is of a saintly man or woman that has lived such a dignified life in the deposit of faith, and we have discerned her in a be, in a beatified state before God, in a saintly state. Uh, you know, thinking of Saint Paul and his scriptures and 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 you know his reflections on sainthood. Um, you know, th there's a long process, and we've talked a little bit about this, the canonization process of saints, but. That's also canonical related because they entered into the canon to the calendar mm -hmm. of the church. That's so right. these remembrances are very important. Um, so you know, white we wear at Christmas time, Easter celebrations of the Lord, except His Passion. His Passion we wear red. Yep. You know, for a martyr we wear red. For Pentecost we wear red. Um, other feast days where we wear white or solemnities uh, could be All Saints, the Nativity of John the Baptist, the Most Holy Trinity, the Chair of St. Peter, the Feast of the Conversion of St. Paul, and also permitted, and this is, this is unique, so for a funeral mass, for example, you have multiple options. Yeah. You know, you could wear white, you could wear violet. Or, or that purple color that we're accustomed to at Lent and, mm -hmm. and Advent. Um, you could wear black, you know. Um, these, are, these are appropriate colors that you could wear at, uh, at a funeral. Yep. Typically, when I go through the discernment process of what color I'm wearing, um, you know, it, it depends on the deceased and their family that's grieving. You know, because the work that we have to do is the continuation of the work of Christ and a participation in the one work of Christ. So in that respect, it's like, you know, I'm going to wear Advent colors here because there's a need for kind of a generation from this yeah. this darkness or uh, and, and we need we need that sense of, of a new beginning. Um, you know, there, there may be a need for black because this is a traumatic mm -hmm. death and it is affected and there's just such extensive grief, um, you know, or the most beautiful death that of, of someone who, you know, is nearing the end and, and they've lived such a holy life and it's just, they're saintly, mm -hmm. saintly people and the, the element of joy and the resurrection and, and, uh, celebration could be appropriately white. So I, I typically discern, uh, but recently, you know, the tragic death of, of Sophia and her murder, 
you know, her favorite color was pink. And, mm. you know, I wore the rose colored vestments, nice. which uh, is Leitare and Gaudete Sunday. It's where the church rejoices in the context of great suffering, mm -hmm. you know, in respect to the disciplines that are associated Relief with... Relief from suffering. Yeah, with, with, with respect to the disciplines of Advent and Lent as it relates to penance and asceticism and, and entering into suffering and anticipation, it is that relief. It's yeah. that rejoice. It's that praise that we give in the midst of the desert um, to God who is meeting us along the way because we are weak, we are limited, we'll never make it through the desert without his assistance, without his yeah. help and, and divine accompaniment. So, you know, these, these colors, you know, white, red, violet, black, you're hearing all of these colors. Well, what's ordinary? You know, green, you know, and, and uh, you know, we have ordinary time. Yeah. And now ordinary doesn't mean plain or simple or whatever. It means ordered or like as in ordination, there's or an ordained, order to it. Yeah. So it's ordered to the calendar and it's focused on that season, particularly is focused on the proclamation of the kingdom, which again is the work. So, you know, green is very earthy. It's very ordinary, but it's also very ordered. And that's yeah. what the, the symbology of that is. And, and also like the, the sense of growth, you yeah, know, and, yeah. and, and, and newness of, of life, you know, the, the, that there's something being birthed into mm. the labors of, of the church. And, you know, th this is also a call for each of you out there, like if you're kind of lukewarm in your practice where you're only kind of going here or there in, in your practice, like the sense of being ordered by the liturgy and your greater participation in it, you know, when it comes to works in the spirit, there's no greater fruitfulness. Mm -hmm. And the church is there structured in her liturgical calendar for you to participate fully and the fruitfulness that's before us. So we've done a whole episode on liturgical colors and all the different vestments. What that they was made. a fun one. So there's a link right up there right now. You can check that out. That was fun. Because you could just appear. Right? Exactly. Yeah. Boom. Yeah. Boom. New different color. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but uh, so, you know, we have the, the six liturgical seasons. We have the colors, white, red, green, violet, black, sometimes gold, sometimes silver. Mm -hmm. And we you can learn more specifically about that. Yeah, and the gold and silver briefly is is really just uh, for Jesus Christ, King of the universe. You know, that's appropriate, gold or silver, Christmas, Easter, some of your high solemnities. Mm -hmm. And if you have a titular parish like mine, St. John Paul II, if I had a gold vestment or a silver vestment, it would be appropriate on, you know, the nomenclature of your, of your parish mm -hmm. if it's named after a saint. That's your high solemnity. That's your high feast of your of your parish, your titular, mm -hmm. uh, you know, name of your parish. So that's kind of like a breakdown of the seasons, right, and the different colors associated with them. But I think it's also good to understand that now the individual calendar is made up of days, right? There's specific feast days, and mm -hmm. they're categorized into, in the new calendar at least, and the old calendar, we'll get into that later. Mm -hmm. But in the calendar that we use now in the church, they're into three main categorizations, right? You have solemnities, feasts, and memorials. Do you want to talk a little bit about yeah. that? And then in respect to memorials, you have obligatory memorials, the memorials that the universal church mm -hmm. upholds. And then you have particular memorials like a, the small M memorial, which is an optional yep. memorial. So <clears throat> solemnities are of the highest degree and are usually reserved for the most important mysteries of the faith. Okay. So we think of, you know, Christmas, Easter, All Saints Day, the most important solemnities of the church, the Immaculate Conception, Pentecost, you know, these, these are very, very important. <clears throat> they have the same basic elements as Sunday, meaning a lot of these are tied to a holy day of obligation. Mm -hmm. Sunday, we are obliged as Catholics to participate. From Saturday at the setting of the sun, we begin to observe mm -hmm. that calling that holy day of obligation, Christ's resurrection. So, <clears throat> and then these elements of Sunday and these solemnities are the most important things for us to come to grasp. There's so doesn't like the, the literally the liturgy and the things that you do, and I don't know how you keep all this in your head, but like the things that you do on specific dates will change. So like you'll be sitting there and sometimes, oh, we didn't do the Gloria today, or we didn't do the creed, or we did do the creed, we did the litany. And like, you don't ever think about it. You just think you, you do it. Mm -hmm. But there's specific reasons and dates 
you know, whether it's a solemnity, a feast or a memorial that you do certain elements, right? Yeah, there, there is. And, and, you know, how I keep it in my head, you know, that's why we went to seminary, you yeah. know, seminary <laughs> was very, very helpful. Um, but it's also, you know, we, we've talked about this before, you know, it's one thing if you study it, it's another thing if you teach it. Yeah. And, you know, and I'm not going to pretend on this show like I've got it all together. And I, I've, you know, I, I just, think everybody knows that. I just celebrated. <laughs> I just celebrated a uh, the feast of the presentation of the Lord, and I think I missed the Gloria. <laughs> you know, wow. I just went like right into let us pray. <laughs> you know what I mean? So it it, it, it definitely <laughs> happens more like I missed the creed. You know, and, and it's like <laughs> so it it definitely does happen, um, especially when you're at a, a you're you're a new parish and you're you're growing fast and it's like you don't have like a committee that's in charge of the yeah. you, know. you don't have a liturgist or anything. exactly you don't have yeah. a liturgist uh, i don't have any of that okay yeah. so you know god willing we get down the road we yeah. build we, we have that employed but um but yeah so <clears throat> basically with solemnities you're going to hear the creed you're going to hear the glory you're gonna you're going to sing these and it, it's proper that it would be sung um and in most cases, you know, there's going to be particular prefaces, you know, when you, the prefaces, the Lord be with you and with your spirit, lift up your, you know, and that, that prayer that, that precedes the holy, holy, holy. Mm -hmm. um, so a feast that honors a mystery or a title of the Lord or our lady or saints in particular importance, such as the apostles or the evangelists, these are called feast days of the church. Now, feasts, a lot of times, is kind of genericized. Everything's a feast, the feast of our Lord, the feast of St. Lawrence, the, the, the feast of our lady, queen of the universe. So feast is kind of the common term, and these are all feasts, but they are... Some are solemn. Well, there's... But in the technicality, it's solemnities, feasts, and memorials. And what you're oh. saying here is that the technical term for feast is... This yes yes okay. and and see I didn't really even kind of you know I didn't know that really. and it's also like this should this should breed culture mm -hmm. so yeah solemnities about, yeah. and feasts like this needs to be practiced in the home celebrated this needs to be celebrated mm -hmm. at the church not just with the liturgical right. ritual and 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 you know exercising what Holy Mother Church has set in the universal calendar but it needs to be articulated with music and food and fellowship and and little uh you know customs that mm -hmm. your local area kind of generate in creativity I, i'll never forget i you know i was sitting with um cardinal lorenzo many years ago mm -hmm. in rome who's one of the most conservative liturgists in the church's most recent history who is just such a phenomenal pastor when it comes to the proper way of celebrating the novus ordo mm -hmm. the new ordo um and he expressed, you know, because I was asking him about specifics like kneeling and receiving on the tongue and communion, you know, uh, you know, honoring this or that and like these different these different particular customs of what people do in devotion. And and he expressed, you know, Rich, the the sense of the church and in, in setting the rubrics for the practice and, and the celebration uh, the proper celebration of the liturgy, um, the church has given room for subsidiarity mm -hmm. is given room for custom to develop, which means, you know, out of the charismatic response of the people, there's something ever being born that's new in the, in the practices of the customs surrounding these li liturgies. That's why here at, at St. John Paul II, we have all of these different cultural groups propping up right now. And, and then, you know they're they're doing a big feast for Our Lady of Guadalupe, a big feast for San Luis, San uh, San Lorenzo Ruiz, mm -hmm. and 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 so many others that are that are coming. The Joe Patty Festival, you know, they're taking ownership over it. There's processions. There's there's processions with music and dancing and and the whole nine. I think a good example of that is like um, certain during Lent. There's certain dispensations granted by certain bishops. In areas with a high Irish population, to you know, dispense you from, from some of your Lenten obligations on St. Patrick's Day, mm -hmm. and that's kind of a St. Joseph too, yeah, yeah, there's a, or an, yeah, mm -hmm. an Italian area, St. Joseph or whatever. There's some, like you said, there is some space to reflect that humanity is messy and unique to areas and and times. So that, yeah. that's pretty cool. But and as heavy as the heart can get in the world, don't we need reasons to? Break and fast, and break the fast, yep. and then enter into a feast together. You know, we yeah. we need that. 
So feasts then are specifically to, well, so like you have the feast of the exaltation of the cross. Mm -hmm. That's a feast, but not a solemnity. Mm -hmm. Um, feasts of Our Lady, right? Mm -hmm. Those are feasts, not memorials. Right. Uh, or very important saints. You have like the feast of Peter and Paul or the feast of one of the apostles, right? Uh, saints that are universally applicable and universally venerated and of incredible importance to the history of the church. Those would be particularly known as feasts. And again, on feast days, there's some particularities of the Mass that are different than maybe on a solemnity mm -hmm. or maybe a Sunday in ordinary time. Mm -hmm. What are those? Yeah, so th that's uh, so in respect to we were talking about um, the creed or the gloria. In a case where you have a feast, the gloria is appropriate. Okay. But typically you don't you don't say or recite <clears throat> the creed communally. Okay. Um, and Unless it falls on like a Sunday, right? Yeah. Like, the creed if it's reserved for Sunday. Mm-hmm. Always, because that is it is a solemnity. So Sunday, and that's a that's a great way to segue to the point is like Sunday is a solemnity. Yeah, and I don't think I don't think a greater majority of Catholics know that. And when you think of what we're talking about, like this should be articulated in your life, like a feast day. Mm -hmm. Well, Sunday should be articulated in your life with greater importance. Yeah, you know, I think a good point to make on that, and talking about the way the calendar is constructed, is that. Sundays outrank every feast or memorial. Uh, Sundays don't outrank a solemnity. So if a solemnity falls on a Sunday, that replaces the the the, the typical Sunday mass liturgy. And pastorally, the USCCB and the bishops <sighs> typically will move yeah. solemnities as well. Yeah, to... we'll get into the, the movable feast, which is just mm -hmm. some really cool things about that. I think what again the point I was trying to make is that. Sunday obligation is so important that the only things that can possibly move it are feasts of our Lord. So not a solemnity of our Lord, which will always be or sometimes moved by the bishops. So and, movable. and what you mean by that is like Christmas. Yeah, Christmas or Easter. Yep. Well, Easter and Easter is always on, on Sunday. Sunday. But <clears throat> but Christmas in particular, yeah. I mean, we just had, the, when we think about this past Christmas, mm -hmm. it landed on Sunday. Right. For pastors, we're always like, oh boy, we've just lost an entire collection. Yeah. You know? <laughs> And <laughs> our operating budget, just on a business level, administratively, like our operating budget depends on uh, on, on Sundays. On yeah. Sundays, yeah. so and and also Christmas and the generosity of the people yeah. too. So also, as as good Catholics, keep that in mind <laughs> for right. your pastors to save them some gray hairs. Uh, you know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, making sure that you're donating on every Sunday and on the feast days, and if it falls on a Sunday, good point. So that kind of covers feasts. So we did solemnities and feasts. Now we're on to memorials, which are the the uh, they have the lowest primacy on the ranking of the days, and memorials are going to be of your more general saints and the saints that are not universally acclaimed in the church or universally and broadly known and venerated. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and there's some, as I mentioned before, that are obligatory. Like we absolutely celebrate memorial. Yeah, we celebrate this memorial in the universal church. Then there's optional ones. Like for me, I don't have an option. When it comes to John Paul II, right. the Universal Church has an option, really. Right. You know, yeah, yeah, they absolutely have an option. You know, and they do not have to celebrate that that particular uh, memorial. So mm -hmm. I think that gives a gives people a, a better sense of you know the options. Mm -hmm. um, for me and and all of my sacristans and parishioners know, I opt to celebrate practically every Everyone, memorial. Yeah. yeah, you do. <clears throat> because one, I love the saints, and two, it just gives us such a great way to begin to articulate that universality and that unity that Christ wants to see. He, he desires to see us as one. And you know, if if we get to know the saints, we need to get to know one another yeah. too, and, and that's the whole mystery of what Jesus is trying to accomplish in our midst. So one thing about those memorials is that during all of Lent and the last week of Advent, any of the memorials can be just a commemoration where you just read the prayer of that saint and then the rest is for that day. Yeah. And then the last kind of... And, and that's the that's very important uh -huh. when it comes to Advent, especially with the the uh, ancient antiphons. Yep. And those liturgies are very solemn leading up to the 25th, mm -hmm. which is the observance of Christmas. And, you know, exactly what you're saying. So I would be wearing 
purple, mm -hmm. even though we may commemorate a particular uh, a saint within it, right. mm -hmm. but it, the, the prominence liturgically is associated to these days leading up to Christmas from, I believe, the 17th uh, all the way to the yeah, 24th. 17th, 24th. And then, the, 24th, that, and then the last kind of outlier is All Souls Day. Mm -hmm. All Souls Day is not a solemnity, but if it falls on a Sunday, it has precedence over the Sunday, mm -hmm. the, the, the the standard Sunday liturgy. Mm -hmm. So those are kind of the differences of solemnities and, and, and hold, you know, feasts or whatever. And those are things that are kind of... Kind of convoluted, so I don't know how you keep it all straight. Thank God for the books. Yeah. You know? Oh my goodness. And the only way that you're you're going to, be, I don't think we ever get it perfectly straight and narrow, um, unless we're Germanic. You know, yeah. everything is ordered. And <laughs> but what happens for me and what I experience in my in my priesthood and my practice of the faith is, as I'm kind of moving through the calendar the mystery of how God influences me in these particular days, like I'll anticipate it in prayer. And it's like, oh, that's, it's the, it's the feast of the Holy Cross. Or, oh, like, and then you have these experiences, you know, providentially mm -hmm. that are tied to all of these amazing, you know, uh, amazing feasts and, and, and memorials. And, and you, you grow more familiar with some of these more obscure mm -hmm. saints in the calendar. No, Ryan, mm -hmm. I know that you love the complexities of the liturgical calendar. This is right in your wheelhouse. This is where he. This shines. is where you shine. I mean, he okay, shines. Okay, but eyes have awakened me from my ecstasy. Okay, <laughs> but now let's make it even a little bit more complicated. And I'm doing this for you because I know you love the complexity and the rigor and the <clears throat> and the uh, precision of calendars. I just love chasubles, <laughs> man. Now we're gonna get into the movable feasts. Oh wow! <laughs> <laughs> You're gonna blow my mind, bro. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so you can like move <laughs> them. So movable feasts are another category of feast days, and these are ones that are not tied to a calendar date. They're tied to almost always all the movable feasts are tied to the date of Easter, because Easter happens on a different time each year. So a lot of the feasts then are marked by Easter, not the calendar date. So is you'll that have, why I Google when is Ash Wednesday every year and yeah, it comes up with something different? That's exactly <laughs> it's right. It's still on a Wednesday, though. It's always on a Wednesday. Isn't that lunar related? It is. So That's kind of cool. Easter falls on the first Sunday after the first full moon after the equinox. Oh, uh, what's the equinox? That's the spring equinox. Spring. Yeah, okay, okay, spring. Yeah, yeah spring. the beginning of spring. Yeah, because like there was a full moon out there, yep. what, today or yesterday yeah. or whatever, right? So now it's like maybe the next full moon... Will be the equinox. So yeah. Easter is the first Sunday after the, the equinox. first full moon of the uh, equinox. That's right. That's so pretty it's cool. Complicated. And that lunar calendar, that's why we have differences in dates with the East, but whatever. But all these movable feasts are tied to the date of Easter. And it's cool that the bishops of any particular conference have to give an announcement. It's called the announcement of the movable feasts every year. Mm. And they say, uh, and yep, like, yep. like here's the one from this year. Wow. It's pretty cool. Announcement of Easter and the movable feast for the year of 2023. Know, dear brethren, that we, as we have rejoiced in the nativity of our Lord Jesus Christ, so by leave of God's mercy, we announce to you the joy of his resurrection, who is our Savior. On the 22nd day of February, will fall Ash Wednesday. On the 9th day of April, you will celebrate joy with Easter Day. In those places where Ascension is celebrated on Thursday, on the 18th day of May will be the Ascension of the Lord, and on and on and on. So they put out this announcement every year on the movable feast because a lot of times people, you know, in the ancient times, they wouldn't know when these feasts should fall, so they would send these letters out saying, because Easter is on this date, calibrate your calendars, let's all sync up. Right, right. So I thought that was a and, pretty and, interesting little... And then there's, because of that, it looks like there's a, a lot of other... Solemnities or feasts that line up with those particular dates. That's right. So mm -hmm. you'll have things like well, 90 days or 40 days from Pentecost. Pentecost. Ascension. Yeah. They yeah. don't fall always every year on March 17th, that's, like St. Yeah. Patrick's Day. They, and then that's why they move them because they get to be like, be like Wednesday and they're like, well, this is Ascension. Let's move it to Sunday. And then everybody gets all mad. And I just, I'm in ecstasy because this is a problem that. Yeah, it's right. amazing. But, that, and so but then this creates all these weird liturgical <clears throat> scenarios. It's like, yeah. oh, well, Easter falls on this day, which means this day falls on a solemnity, but what has precedent? It gets pretty complicated. Mm -hmm. 
but I think it's pretty interesting. And they must the, work with like spreadsheets and stuff. They've probably got a. They do. They have a big Vatican <laughs> Excel spreadsheet, and they're like. What do we do this What's year? What's going on with the moon? <laughs> yeah. All right. It's definitely run by a guy like you. <laughs> <laughs> you. You Italians are known for your precision. Yeah. That's when you hire the German guy. That's right. <laughs> hey, listen, this is going to be really exciting for you. I mean, <laughs> you guys can build cars like no one else, but you can never get them there on time. Right? Uh, yeah, I love their cars. <laughs> no matter yeah. how fast you go. Doesn't yeah. matter. Yeah. And then, so that's those are cool. I mean, if you like that kind of thing, you like it. If you don't. Just yeah. show up to mass and you'll figure it out. <laughs> and look, the easiest way to get around all this is just go to daily mass and you don't really. Yeah, have to you'll worry never about miss this. anything. Yeah, yeah, you see so it all. The final thing I think to cover about the liturgical calendar is the different reading cycles, right? Yeah. And this one is pretty straightforward, but it's also something I don't think most people think about. Um, so in our calendar, we have different cycles. We have an A year, a B year, and a C year. It's a three-year cycle. And that's just for the readings on Sunday. That's yep. right. Okay. And then, and then the readings do... for the day is oh. a is a two-year cycle. So oh, year okay. one, year two. Year so 10. if it's a if it's two thousand and one, it would be year one. So you read the Bible oh, in really? a year. I didn't know that. So or, it's odd and even. Okay. You read the Bible every day. If you read the Bible every day, it takes two years to do the Bible in a year. Because Mike Schmitz has got something going on then. He can do it in a year, and a church can't even do it in a year. And you know who has something even greater going on than Father Mike Schmitz? Who? It's not me, that's for sure. <laughs> I'm no Father Mike Schmitz. But let me tell you something. Hallow's got something really going on. Oh, that's yeah. right. So if you get the Hallow app, you can go through all the daily readings, and you can do the Bible in a year, which is, seems like a time warp. My wife did it in Hallow, too, yeah. yeah. So, but she did it double time and did it in a half a year. Yeah. She did the Bible in a half a year with Father mm, <laughs> 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 but he's got catechism in a year. Yeah. On Hallow, you've got Jonathan Rumi, Mark Wahlberg, some incredible Sister Catholic Miriam, leaders. Bishop Sister Miriam Barron, Father Josh Johnson. I mean, you got it's, like, you got it's incredible the amount of material they have, though. They have covered the rich heritage and history of the Catholic faith from the very beginning, covering different spiritualities and charisms, yeah. Lexio Divina's music. There's all sorts of aids to the spiritual life, and it's there's a reason why it's the number one Catholic app. Yeah, in over the app a billion store. people have prayed. Over a billion prayers have been prayed through this app. It's really awesome. So many resources: music, prayer, reflection, all kinds of uh, resources that that are very helpful to the Catholic life. So, if you want to try it for free, go to catholictalkshow.com forward slash hollow. Uh, our other sponsor that we love mentioning that we've worked with for years. They is, follow a strict liturgical calendar. They sure do. In many respects. And, you know, they're known really primarily for Exodus 90, right. which was a 90 day treatment of asceticism leading up to Easter. That's so right. it, uh, they, Exodus is a movable feast because <laughs> they tied their Exodus to Easter. So right. Exodus starts on a different year, day every year, yep. which is a kind of, you know, that's kind of a thing every year. About. Whenever, whenever Exodus starts, I, I, from all my friends is the chatter is always like, well, when, when does Exodus 90 start? Yeah, yeah. Well, it changes yeah. different every year. Yeah. And <laughs> this is exactly why. Even when you, even when you Google search, it'll come up too. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. When does Exodus 90 start? But yeah. the, the neat thing about Exodus is they are branching out and they have so much material. Even if you don't want to do a 90, day discipline, there's all sorts of things that they're doing where you can kind of follow these different prayer practices and fellowship and have some fraternity where you're disciplining your masculinity and really developing the virtues that are associated right. to manhood. So Exodus, we couldn't be more proud of that partnership and, yeah. and we're grateful for, for their sponsorship. And how would they get to know or participate through our through Well, our if connection? you want to participate, like, uh, like 45,000 men did this year, you can go to catholictalkshow.com for slash Exodus, and you can download the app and find all the different resources and all the different ways that they help you become a better man. So check that out today. Now, the last thing, like this one, I, I didn't know this because I never understood the logic of this until I re, you know researched for this episode. So you have the years one and two, but A years, B years, and C years, and I've never made this connection. I, I Maybe I'm just, you know, wasn't looking for it, but A years are primarily the Gospel of Matthew. Matthew. Yeah, that's B mm -hmm. is Mark, Mark, C is Luke, mm -hmm. and then always Easter is from John. Oh, John. And yeah. John is on all the like a lot yep. of the feast days, mm -hmm. Easter, Christmas. 
Um, I didn't know that. I didn't know that either. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I've been going to Mass for some 42 odd years now. Mm-hmm. So and with Mark, a little gap somewhere Matthew, in there between. Luke. Mark mm-hmm. Matthew Luke, yep. ABC. Mm-hmm. Yep. And then the first readings, uh, you know, and typically the fashion that we have in, in, in the liturgical structure is usually from the Old Testament. Mm-hmm. We're very familiar with that. Yep. And reflects the important themes of the gospel reading. The second reading is usually from one of the epistles, a letter re- written to yep. an early church community. These letters are read semi continuously. And each Sunday we pe- pick up close to where we left off the Sunday before. So you, we're not reading, when you look at it in like the, the three cycles, ABC mm-hmm. or year one, two, and you even throw the liturgy of the hours and you look at all of those readings, we aren't covering the entirety of the Bible, but we are covering really the very most important parts for us to come and to contextualize the revelation, the proclamation of the kingdom. Yeah, I mean, you don't read from numbers very often and take the accounting of the, the Kutra right. of the temple. Like, right. you're getting the entirety of the history and the message of it mm-hmm. with some, I guess, it's more like merciful brevity, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. You know? Yeah. It's kind of like the, um, the Old Testament and the New Testament and the contextual stuff yeah. that's in there it always provides like, mm-hmm. like a typology yeah. back and forth. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So yeah, I didn't know that. A years are Matthew, which, you know, B years, Mark. And, and those are movable. Are mm-hmm. Those are not movable. No. Oh. That's really interesting. Boring. Boring. <laughs> Can't move it. Can't move it. So, and then I think, you know, the last point is that a lot of these calendars were changed. A lot mm-hmm. of the feast days were changed. I mean, if you went back before Vatican II, you'd have things like, you know, time before Lent and, you know, time after Epiphany. And a lot of the feast days were moved around. But this is the calendar that we use now. But if you're interested in learning about the old calendar, uh, you know, if you have Latin mass communities, they'll follow the old calendar in their liturgy which is just as good and just as valid, but we are covering the one that the majority of Catholics cover here today. So mm-hmm. that, my friends, are the calendar. The liturgical calendar. You guys are both calendar girls Boom. now. And this is so, this is so great. I'm, I'm grateful for a, a greater sense of the liturgy. We're all learning, you know, and, and it's we need to put our faith into practice. So we appreciate you connecting with us each and every week at the Catholic Talk Show. We hope that this has been a help for you to just get a basic introduction to the liturgical calendar and some of the colors that you see when you come to Mass. But again, just that encouragement, go to daily Mass. Yeah. You aren't going to miss a thing. And be sure to click that bell so you don't miss any of this content. It is the time of year to subscribe. It is the time of year to click like and share. And it is always the time of year to go to catholictalkshow.com forward slash Patreon and help support the show. Spread the good news wherever you find yourself this week. And God bless. We'll see you next week. Mm.